Okay, looks like we're recording. So everyone, this is, of course, Gordon Einstein, crypto attorney based in Dubai, uh, continuing this ser the series of hard-hitting, exciting interviews with people I know and like and respect. And of course, on that list, we have Justin Newton, uh, Netkey, who's going to tell us all kinds of cool stuff that I'll let him explain. So J Justin, I've known you for years, but now you and I are both in the UAE having known each other in Los Angeles. How, how does that happen? And, and amazingly enough, we first met in Kiev. So we oh good good memory yes. we've been in yeah we've been in like every weather environment together so from ten ten Celsius below to whatever it's going to be here this summer uh, yeah, but uh, yeah it's going to be a little warm uh, so uh, yeah in terms of like some of my background and how I got here so I've been doing startups for like thirty years actually, now, actually, I, know, I, I started I'm gonna roll you way back where were you born where are you from. Oh yeah, so I, I was uh, I was born in Michigan, uh, but I had the good sense to move when I was six months old, and I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania in a like super rural area where I was. Our house was in the middle of the forest. I couldn't see my neighbors' houses. The people two doors down from me had a herd of cows. Oh, wow. uh, you know, so uh, not a lot of tech enablement there. Um, I ended up uh, for high school. I went to a boarding school that was about an hour from my house. That was like an all-male boarding school. That was the best education I had. It was actually better than my university education. Interesting. And for me, I think a lot of the background in like how I think and how I think about things and approach things really came from there. Uh, then uh, I went to Northwestern University, mm -hmm. uh, and I was actually the first student there that was a dual engineering and English writing major. Um, I had early in my career, I, I worked as an intern with an engineering department mm -hmm. uh, when I was like 16, 17, 18 years old, something like that. And one of the guys in the department was super smart, but couldn't communicate to save his life. And so I thought to myself, what would be worse torture than knowing you could fix something, but not being able to convince anyone to let you do it. Sure. And so anytime I had a chance to do like a writing or public speaking or anything like that, I always took it up. So I ended up being an English writing and engineering major. Um, this was right when the kind of internet was being developed. I got into university in 91. Mm -hmm. And in 94, I decided to leave before getting my degree because it seemed like going to build the internet was going to be more interesting than another year of university. Oh my God, you're, you're um, one of those guys. Totally. Yeah, and honestly, that ended up being like the best decision of my life for me at the time because like 1994 to 1995, you learned way more by be having your fingers into working in the internet than you possibly could have learned in a university. And, you know, frankly, by the time anybody was like looking for credentials, everybody already knew who I was. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, uh, it didn't hold me back that I didn't have a degree or a diploma at a time when really less people uh, skip that step than do today. Interesting. I mean, um, yeah. Well, actually, I got, it was, what did your parents think of this? Well, my mom was a college professor, so uh, they weren't the most excited about it mm -hmm. um, at the time. But, you know, not because they like were upset that I was making like that I was being presumptuous or something. But for them, they started out with not a lot in their life. And for them, education was the key that allowed them to be successful. And so they had a lot of concern that if I skipped that, that that was going to limit what my opportunities were in the future. Um, you know, I can tell you later on in life, I continued to make choices that that seemed outside of the norm in terms of the choices I made. And actually, at one point, my mother came back to me and said, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me, but you've actually always made great decisions that have worked out really well. So I'm going to just go with it. So it Isn't was, you know, nice we just found hear. different paths to being successful. It was really nice to hear. Yeah, absolutely. It was I, obviously it's a moment I remember to this day, and it was probably 20 years ago. Sure. I mean, that, that, that's um, so, actually pretty big you know, for a, a parent. Of course, they love you, but for them to have like the meta awareness to track behavior over time and come to that kind of conclusion and to compliment you on it is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was, uh, it was nice. It was nice. I think that time I was leaving a company that just went public to go to one that was just at a very early startup stage. So, you know, I think I was like the first person to leave the public company of their own choice after the IPO. Um, and that ended up being a great choice. The, the next job I took was like my favorite one before this one. Uh, I ended up staying at the company like nine and a half years and doing good stuff there. So it, it, it was the right choice, but it was. What, what was the public company? What was the private startup? And then we'll get to, to the present. 
Sure. So I, I actually, so like the last four companies that I led part of all of technology for before starting NetKey all went, all went public on NASDAQ at over a billion dollar valuation. So the one I left was a company called AboveNet that did like uh, data center stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so built out data centers. We had like Hotmail and eBay and people like that as clients of ours. Um, although to be honest, at the time that we went public, about 80% of our revenue came from adult businesses because they were the people that were buying bandwidth at the time. Mm -hmm. uh you know but that that wasn't in our s1 uh but then uh the next company i went to was uh, net zero the free internet company sure best known company that i was at and actually my co-founder net key actually worked at net zero as well uh we were the first two executives brought into the company who'd ever worked on the internet before so we got there about nine months and eight months before the ipo and kind of took it through that rocket ship mm -hmm. and uh then i stuck around for a while afterwards uh, when I left there, I went to a company called Demand Media, which did large, kit, large, uh, large amounts of content at scale. We actually built basically like a mechanical Turk for content, where like one person would write the headline, one person would write the article, one person would edit the article. And so we had like for every article, there were like 30 different contributors. And then we had a, you know, a process and a system that put it all together. Um, e even like... Uh, 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 one of the things that we did there that was really interesting is we took SEO back a step mm -hmm. and instead of figuring out what we wanted to write and then search engine optimize it, we looked for searches that were happening that didn't have a good answer. And then we would write the answer to it, basically the you... content that was required to fulfill the search in a good way. So I, I understand looking at search activity, how do you evaluate whether or not it's gotten a good answer in a timely manner? Uh, well, we had software that, that did all that, that could evaluate, uh, the quality of the content that was out there it was pretty similar to the tools that we would use to evaluate the quality of the content that we were writing before publishing it. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, yeah, it ended up being a super interesting company. Actually, uh, we were so good at SEO that when Google tried to stop us, it made the front page of the print version of Wired Magazine. That was the cover article about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that like it killed all of our competitors, but it dropped our traffic for about four days because we understood Google search better than they did. And so when they twiddled all the knobs, we knew how to twiddle all of our stuff to make it make it show back up at the top again. Um, that, that part of it was pretty fun, although, to be honest, not very like morally satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, but technically, it was a lot of fun to work on. And it was really cool because we, in a lot of ways, decentralized the publishing process around content because we had like, you know, 50,000 contributors that would each write about, you know, a certain content area or a certain type of things that they would do, like either edit or write headlines or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we would pay them like between 30 cents and a couple dollars per article, depending on what it was that they were doing. And so before decentralization, we built a centralized version of decentralized content creation uh, and then wrapped it around the search engine uh, optimization piece. And yeah, we were not only created that content for ourselves, but we did it for big brands like Condé Nast and USA Today and others when they were trying to attract more traffic to their site. We, they would say, okay, here's a topic area that we're interested in, like travel. And we would write them like 10,000 travel articles and have them published on our site. So it was, we, it, was, it was human intelligence doing what people are doing with AI today, you know, and in many ways. We did like human versions of AI content generation. That's a that's a funny way to put it. And, and well, it, I mean, it's kind of true, though. <laughs> say, say again. I mean, it's kind of true, though, right? We just had tens of thousands of people doing it instead of having computers do it. I, I'm not saying it's not true. It, it's actually, I, I think the humor there is, you just raised my awareness that I'm, we're kind of defaulting now towards the idea that what we're reading is AI generated, and the human writing is the anomaly which is a complete inverse yeah. of perceptions before, but that that shift of expectation has happened so quickly and so subtly that I just thought about it. It's like when I'm reading something or seeing a video on YouTube, I'm kind of assuming without thinking about it overtly that it's AI generated. And I'm surprised when it's not mm -hmm. now. And I think that's yeah. going to be yeah. much, it's just, a, it's just the tip of that. And I think three or four years from now, it's going to be like, what, you wrote this yourself? What's wrong with you? Or why? In a few years, you and I are going to be AI. Well, I mean, speak for yourself. Podcast will be AI. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just for any yeah. AI watching this, 
No, never mind. I don't even want to talk. I don't want to talk to you yet. You, when you start talking to me, I'll talk back. Okay. So, and then nice. that was right before. One, one last slide. Sure. Uh, no, there was one more after that, which was a company called Blackline Systems. I was CTO of where we did accounting software for the Fortune 100. Mm -hmm. And probably the most, uh, I'll say, exciting thing about that one was uh, we were considered a key financial control for two of the two big to fail banks in 2010. And so uh, given what I'm doing now in risk and compliance stuff, let's just say I got a lot of experience in being audited by the federal government mm -hmm. when we were working in that role, just based on what it was that we were doing and who our clients were, did quite well in that process. Um, one side thing I did that is, that's also pretty relevant to where we, we came to today is back in 1995, um, I co-founded what became the largest trade association for internet service providers. Mm -hmm. And from 95 through 2001, I was our public policy director. And so basically every law or regulation that was written about the internet during that period of time got sent to me first to review and provide feedback on before it was made public or turned into a real law or, or guideline or anything anyway. And so, you know, definitely all of them had at least a few sentences here and there that came directly out of my keyboard um, in terms of editing and, and changing those. And that's just to say I've spent or most sitting at the intersection of brand new technologies and how legislatures and regulators respond to those technologies and, you know, attempt to control them either for ben the benefit or for the detriment of the industry that it's operating in. And probably that is one of the things that led me to what we're doing here uh, currently at NetKey. As where, I said, you know, when we can- segue both in terms of the flow of our interview, but also in terms of the flow of your individual development and career. So that's neat. So do, yeah, for sure. So tell us about yeah, your so, current company. Right. So we came into the, the I don't know, the Web3 ecosystem, you would call it now, back in about 2014. Okay. Which at the time, this was like a year before uh, Ethereum came out, right? They were just doing like the Ethereum fundraise at the time. And mm -hmm. so it was basically like Bitcoin and Litecoin and Dogecoin and a few other things. Um, and, you know, what I said is, look, uh, one, there's a lot of ways this reminds me of the early internet because what the internet was, the magic of the internet at its core was that it was a network that was open and permissionless for anyone to use. Yes. And more importantly, open and permissionless for anyone to build on top of that was coming behind a very closed and permission network. Um, you know, I can't imagine like Uber or Airbnb ever existing if you had to get the phone company's lawyers to sign off on it before you opened it up, sure. right? It just never would happen. And so, you know, the internet allowed for a wave of inclusion, a wave of innovation, a wave of value creation as a result of that open and permissionless uh, nature. Well, with just it basically just being Bitcoin, I said, look, it's too early to understand what are all the problems this ecosystem is going to solve. And so instead, we tried to take a look and say, what are all the problems that the ecosystem is going to have? Half. And identity, yeah, have identity, risk and compliance really came to the like the top of that list. Um, identity, both because uh, one, we knew that regulators were eventually going to get involved. Mm -hmm. But also, frankly, you know, when you're dealing with a trustless network, uh, um, mass market individuals, the way that they build trust is around identity, right? A crypto anarchist might be happy interacting with the hash of a public key as a way to communicate and to do things. Mm -hmm. But people want names. They want to know who's on the other end of the communication that they're having. I, I mean, and so, right, let me jump in for a second. I, I think when they say trustless, that's not how they meant it. I think they meant that you don't need an intermediary, but you can trust the network to complete the transaction, and you don't have to rely on the other party. Sure, but I mean, if you if the if the network is is irreversible, mm -hmm. right, and you don't have a trusted third party who can protect you. Now you have to be really sure about who you're sending or receiving assets from. Maybe not as much receiving, but definitely sending assets to. Yes. Right. Like again, you know, uh, 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 and we've seen it even with really skilled people in the ecosystem. They've ended up sending things to a wrong address because of, you know, the lack of a functional identity layer that sits on top of the networks. And that can happen either via mistake or mm -hmm. via malicious activity. And so, you know, while many of the people that are hardcore in our ecosystem may super feel super comfortable sending to a hash of a public key, you know, if my, my mother-in-law is sending money to someone, she'd really like to have a name on who's on the other end of that transaction and not a hash. 
Yes. Right. Like early on in Bitcoin, I would send some people my Bitcoin address and they would like be like, was my messenger hacked? Because they saw this weird string of letters and numbers that didn't make any sense to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And a bunch of people have gone about resolving that in a bunch of different ways, like ENS and other things like that. But we even actually uh, uh, authored a Bitcoin standard back in 2015 that had an off-chain protocol that would allow you to share identity in parallel with the transaction so that you could actually know before committing to the transaction who's, who's on the other side of it. Um, and that can be used for personal reasons or potentially for risk and compliance reasons for things like travel. And, and was, so, that, was that identity publicly viewable on the blockchain or was that just- No, through? no, no, no. It, was peer, peer to, it went peer to peer over a private encrypted channel between the participants in the transaction. Okay. You know, so I, I was a privacy geek long before I started working in identity. So the idea of ever publishing anything vaguely like identity data on chain is is very much against my ethos or anything that we would think about it. And would you say that you're still a privacy geek slash advocate to the same extent as before? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think it's important that anybody that's working in the identity arena actually comes from that background so that anything that they're working on has privacy by design built into what they're doing. And that any time that they're touching or working with identity data or designing something that shares it or that utilizes it, they're thinking about things like, how do I ensure no one sees this that shouldn't see it or doesn't absolutely need to see it? You know, how do I ensure that I'm sharing the minimal amount of data that's required for a given activity or transaction, right? How do I protect the data if I'm a guardian or custodian for that data for a period of time? Sure. And, you know, I've seen so many things out there that have been built by people who, you know, frankly, don't think about those things at the core of what they do that end up, you know, either on purpose or inadvertently leaking PII into public places. Which is scary. Um, it, it's funny, I, I recorded a show with Bruce Fenton yesterday that can get published in a week. And he's yep. he's, he's quite clear, I'm not saying anything that's a secret, he's, he's quite clear that he's against the whole idea of KYC, yep. and then, you know, which of course means he's against the idea of identifying your counterparty. It's it's this yeah. you know, crypto anarchist libertarian view. And we, we were also discussing how do you reconcile with the fact that we're all living here in the Middle East? which, you know, is, isn't exactly that. And I think, I, think the, yep. I think the conclusion is you do what you need to do to, to move the ball forward. So, yeah, and I mean, that's, that's... Go ahead. Yeah, and I, I'm not necessarily the person that would have written the KYC and AML rules the way that they're written. But what I do do is build tools that allow developers and entrepreneurs and et cetera to be able to meet those rules and requirements in the way that it provides the most safety to the end user data that's possible. Mm. That makes right? a lot of sense. So, you know, yeah, yeah. All right, so tell me about your company. Yeah, so my company is NetKey. Uh, we do a few things in the space. One is a lot of it is KYC and AML work. So mm -hmm. we've done that for layer one networks like Hedera, Ashcraft, and Cella. We've done it for exchanges, OTC desks, asset issuers, et cetera. But probably my favorite project that I've worked on so far was we got brought in by the government of El Salvador after they had problems with other identity vendors mm -hmm. to clean up the identity inside of their platform, kick off the bad actors and ensure that the Salvadoran people were able to make proper use of that network and get the most value out of it. Um, and so we do KYC and AML for them, continue to do it today. They also use our liveness and biometric tools as a way to provide account security to make sure that you know when certain activities happen, like let's say you install on a new phone or you change mm -hmm. your phone number or escalate your level of privilege, that the account owner is still in control of the account and it hasn't somehow been compromised by a third party. Um, so we do that. That was a big win. We've expanded. I love that project. There's yeah. so many reasons that it's great. One is it's like financial inclusion for real people. Um, you know, I can't tell you like how happy it made me when I would, I, I lived down there for like a year and a half during the project. Um, it was a great place to live during the COVID period um, because like you could do everything outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, people weren't angry at each other the way they were in the United States and my biggest customer was there at the time. So it was a good reason to be down there, but I'd literally go into the supermarket and out of three people in the line in front of me, two of them would end up paying with Chivo wallet. you know? And so to be engaged and working on a project that mm -hmm. like, affected real people's day-to-day -day lives was, you know, not that I don't love everything that's happening in the Web3 group in crypto space, but that was especially moving and touching. 
Um, you know, another thing that was great about it was that uh, uh, coming in and cleaning up after there had been massive identity fraud that was, you know, frankly done by very professional criminal organizations uh, was a really fun technical challenge. Um, one of the cool things uh, actually about working in KYC and AML in crypto is you're frequently in the deep end of the swimming pool with respect to criminal actors, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, international criminal networks, state level actors, like people that have funded teams to try and get around these risks and controls. And, you know, that's way more fun than trying to stop someone who's trying to buy beer, uh, you know, who's underage. Danger from those groups? Um, not yet, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll hope that it stays that way. Yeah. We'll, I, uh, we'll I, I think that that you're, you're in a safer environment now, but if you're in El Salvador and you're, you're killing the golden goose and you're dealing with state level, you know, advanced, advanced persistent threat actors, was there ever a moment where you're like, Hmm. Not while I was down there, to be honest, I okay. felt pretty safe when I was in El Salvador. Uh, you know, um, uh, they, they did a pretty good job from a security perspective down there. Um, it wasn't, it didn't feel like a high risk. As a matter of fact, for like the couple months at the end that I lived at the beach, I never locked the house's doors. You know, when wow. I checked into it, the owner of the house handed me the keys to the house. And he's like, Hey, you can lock the doors if you want to, but I never do. And I was like, all right, well, I understand what the standard is here. So no, I mean, I lived for months with the doors unlocked. Uh, yeah. well, you know, while I was living down there, it was fine. <sighs> yeah, or your house in Los Angeles. Yep. You know, I mean, it's actually one of the things I love about living in UAE is like if I set my wallet down on a table and walk away for twenty minutes, I'm going to come back and it's going to be there. <laughs> it will be, um, be there the next if, morning, which is bizarre. <laughs> I've, I've probably true. Somewhere. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't tried that yet. Well, I, I'm not saying to do it on purpose. I mean, I I, I have the experience where. These are my favorite ear earbuds, these galaxies. And I left these in a car, a, a taxi, not an Uber. And I called the transportation department and the, the driver came back with them. It was like the most insane experience of my life. You know, I love these things, but they're, they're yeah. cheap, but they're not, they're not cheap. So I'm, I'm, I was thrilled to get it back. I was like, wow, where am I living? This is crazy. So, totally. okay. So talk totally. more about Neki. And so the, KYC we, and AML. Yeah, KYC and AML. So that what we started doing more recently with that as well is we started moving into reusable credentials mm -hmm. where we've developed what, what we call a credential authority, where we work with people that have built like reusable ID wallets and we'll issue the credential into the wallet and maintain the life cycle of that credential. So, you know, think of it really like how an SSL certificate works on a website where every time you go to the website, they can share their certificate. So, you know, it's really the website you want to go to. The same thing exists for identity credentials called W3C verifiable credentials mm -hmm. for uh, uh, Web3. And so we can issue credentials directly into a user's wallet and then they can share those credentials and sign with the private key to prove who they, they are, who they say they are potentially avoiding having to go through another entire KYC process where they have to show their documents and biometrics and all that other kind of stuff. And so uh, we've been working on projects with that in a number, number of regions and hoping to get some here uh, locally soon as well. And then the last piece we've been working on is we've been taking a close look at what's been happening in DeFi. And you know, DeFi, when we look at it, it's, it's an amazing space, right? This is definitely one of those open and permissionless innovation areas that I think is gonna be really exciting around what we're doing. But we saw really two challenges that it has right now. Um, one is institutional capital is kind of sitting on the sidelines. Because if you go to a bank or a regulated financial institution, at the end of the day, their, you know, their risk and compliance team can still say no. And so until DeFi has the kinds of compliance that they can trust, those actors and their, capa their capital and their transaction volume is all going to sit on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And so we built a product called DeFi Sentinel, which is a compliance oracle for DeFi that can plug into any layer one protocol, smart contract, or DAP, and allow it to have the same kinds of compliance that a bank has, a securities exchange has, or a broker dealer has. And so the first use so, case let, around let, that. Let me understand that. So it's an oracle. So it's, it's external to the DeFi platform, but the DeFi platform can yep. call it? Is that how it works? Or what's the, what's the, what's yeah, the mechanics? Yeah, basically we have, yeah, well, I can't get into too much of the details of the mechanics, but basically we've developed a way to be able to send a real-time signal on a transaction by transaction basis. 
-hmm. into a smart contract or DAP to let it know that it's safe to proceed and potentially to insert other data in there as well that might be needed. So for example, OECD, who's the global tax authority, tax mm -hmm. regulator, has recommended in the future that DeFi protocols, and this blows my mind, may have to do tax withholding. And so we can actually pass a user by user tax withholding rate into the smart contract so that it can do appropriate withholding at the time of the transaction. Or as another example, uh, right now, basically all lending on chain is collateralized, right? It's over collateralized to be able to do lending. But a lot of the lending in the world is not collateralized. It's based on your credit score. Mm -hmm. And we can pass in data relating to that credit score on a transaction by transaction basis to start to allow non-collateralized lending to occur via DeFi contracts and smart protocols. Or, you know, insurance today is managed as like one giant risk pool, mm -hmm. right? Where everyone in the pool gets the same rate in terms of the risk. Well, we can actually like create a, using DeFi Sentinel, create a bridge between people's off-chain actuarial and risk scoring engines and the smart contract itself so that you can get much more precise insurance rating that can happen into on-chain protocols. So we can do KYC and AML work, but we can also get other information that helps support a transaction individually versus something that the entire chain needs to see in order to drive better decision-making and better compliance into DeFi. And do you, the, does the DeFi platform need to be upgraded or, or made aware of your service or is it something that can operate or does your does DeFi Sentinel operate against it without its participation? No, no, no. It absolutely needs to participate. There's a one-time update that needs to happen either to the smart contract or protocol to basically make it Sentinel aware. Mm -hmm. But once it becomes aware, you know, once it has that awareness, all the changes, let's say that the rules change or you want to update your actuarial risk tables mm -hmm. or there's a new compliance requirement that comes into place. There's no additional changes that need to get made at the smart contract layer to be able to accept those changes. That all can happen off-chain inside of the Oracle. So it's a one-time implementation. And then from there, it just goes forward. Interesting. Well, wow, that's fascinating. Has, has this been adopted? How far along are you in the process of developing and deploying this? Uh, so it's it's in the MVP running stage. We've got one layer one network where we've deployed some transactions and test network. Uh, we've got two uh, large regulated public entities that are deploying it into their test nets over the next couple of weeks and months. And then we've got a bunch of uh, smaller projects and protocols that are focused on uh, providing DeFi directly to institutions, which have signed up and are ready to move forward with the project over the next you know, quarter or two quarters. It's interesting. You're, you're, you're framing it as this allows institutional money to get into DeFi, but it's also, I think, broader than that. It's just bringing compliance to DeFi generally. With, with this well, side effect point, that, yes, it's true, institutions may not be able to get into it. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, point one was allowing institutions to get in. Point two, which I, I didn't quite get to yet because I guess I was babbling, is that regulators are starting to expect DeFi protocols to be compliant, right? So, you know, uh, regulators over here in UAE are currently like writing up the rules for DeFi and they'll be publishing drafts of them, I think, over the coming months, from my understanding. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the US, uh, you've seen um, steps towards regulation by enforcement. So for example, back in December, when the Binance settlement came out, mm -hmm. uh, one of the regulators, when they were up at the podium announcing it said, you know, hey, this is a warning to both centralized exchanges and to DeFi operators that you need to get your act in order or we're coming for you. That was a paraphrase. I didn't get it word for word right. Well, but it, you know, it sounds like the US. DeFi's, yeah, DeFi's on the plate. But you know, I'm sure Hong Kong is coming up with their regulations. I'm sure Singapore is coming up with their regulations. You know, um, I sit on advisory groups to regulators in other jurisdictions, and I know they're starting to do consultations on DeFi and starting to under try to understand what they need to do there and how they can appropriately regulate it. So it's absolutely something that's on regulators' plates right now. That'll probably be a second phase, right? Phase one is the institutions who want access. They won't get access or they won't access anything until things mm -hmm. are compliant. Phase two is going to be the regulators, you know, pushing it more broadly into the ecosystem, where if you're either going to be registered in a jurisdiction, which most DeFi protocols won't register until they have to, right? They're decentralized. Mm -hmm. Or 
you know, in the case of the US, if you just have users from the US using your platform, that pulls you into their purview. And so it's gonna be based both on where the protocol is, but also where the users of that protocol are, is going to start to drive the need for compliance into those protocols. So let me, here's the question I always ask. I mean, assuming that DeFi is actually decentralized and it's not just a marketing term, and especially when it's being run either by a true DAO or someone published the smart contract and went away, which can happen. How do you, how do you actually get it to comply if it's just code? It's, I, it's, I guess, number one. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, the one is, so I, I would say, you know, um, and, and none of these things that I would necessarily want the world to work but it just is the way the world works, right? Um, yeah. I would use as an example, sort of what, what happened with Tornado Cash, mm -hmm. right? Tornado Cash is relatively decentralized. They had a DAO behind it that runs the decision-making on it, all that other sort of thing. But you know what happened is at a certain point, uh, the US government decided that it was important to shut it down. And so they, they one, they sanctioned it, right? And number two, they started going after the known actors that were behind it, right? In this case, it was the founders and developers that were behind it. Mm. So they, you know, criminalized the founders and went after them. And I agree there could be cases where a developer attempts to be anonymous, but so far the only person that we know that's done that successfully at scale is Satoshi. Mm. Um, and there are many ways he's a mythical person or a group of people or she or they or whatever Satoshi is. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as we, you know, no one else has really managed to be invisible in that way over a long period of time. And two, um, the act of sanctioning it meant that no one wants to interact with it anymore, right? Because if I interact with it from my centralized wallet, they're going to block me. And if I interact with it from my decentralized wallet, now that wallet is tainted. So if I go to interact with any centralized services, on-ramps or off-ramps, whatever, mm. either I'm not going to be able to use them at all, or I'm going to have to go through a ton of extra validation and verification work before they're going to allow me to use their service. And so there's tools the governments have to maybe not completely eliminate those smart contracts. Tornado Cash is still running. Yes. But the volume of transactions that's going through it is... An, incredibly small fraction, like one or 2% of what it was before the sanctioning occurred. And what's, well, I mean, you, you made a good point there. You're not dealing with, wow, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you up on something. Your, your, your first very good point is you're not saying that you're endorsing the way the world is. You're acknowledging the way the world is and then trying to take advantage of the opportunities that presents and, and just work with it because it is what it is. That's number one. Number two is we either said in, in the pre-interview or during this interview, you had, I think you said during the reporter portion, you worked on policy and there's laws that have your, has your fingerprints on it. And you were essential, you were your own Oracle to policymakers. And are you able, is this something you have the capacity, you and others have the capacity to influence, or is it just, Governments are going to do whatever they're going to do when it comes to DeFi and we just need to accept it. Yeah, I mean, there's always an opportunity to influence, right? And that's one of the reasons that I would encourage well, sorry, people that are I, working. I don't know that there is actually. I mean, sometimes the governments will just want the revenue and not like it and say, forget it. Thanks for your opinion. No. So, well, you, you, you may not change what the, the overall direction is, mm -hmm. but you can certainly do things that have a meaningful impact on the way that things happen, right? Okay. And so, you know, one of, one of the, the uh, you know, kind of the way that I would think about it is um, the regulators are not gonna understand the space and the tools and all and the capabilities and technical capabilities, et cetera, the way that people working in the ecosystem have. And so, you know, the they may come in and say, you know, we need to like, bring a hammer and just smash this thing, mm -hmm. right? And by, you know, and not really maybe care about the collateral damage, but not know a way to not have the collateral damage okay. because they don't have the understanding to have finesse. 
And so by coordinating and collaborating and working with the regulators and the entities, you can go in and be like, wait, 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 you don't need to smash this with a hammer. You can carve the bad part out with a scalpel. And so, you know, here's all the damage the hammer is going to do. Here's how you could solve your problem with a scalpel. So let's go in and just carve the bad part out rather than smashing everything that's around. Yes. Right? And so, you know, in those ways, you can actually work with things that, and that can have a big impact on, you know, sort of like what the direction is. So I, I can give you an example of that from the, the internet days. Um, so I was, um, I got brought in like the day before a U.S. representative was about to uh, launch his anti-spam law. This was back in 95, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and made, it might have been 96. It was Chris Smith. Out. And uh, the guy was like a big, uh, you know, anti-crime guy and all this sort of stuff. And he wasn't necessarily great on civil liberties and that sort of thing. And there was a line in the bill that he wrote that would have criminalized anonymous speech online. It would have made it illegal to have any anonymous speech online. And I read it and I thought in my head, oh man, this whole thing was a Trojan horse to just destroy free speech and anonymous speech and that sort of thing. And he wanted our organization that we created to endorse his bill before he announced it on the floor of Congress. Mm -hmm. And I called up his legislative analysts, who are the people that actually write the bill. And I said, hey, um, I would really like to be able to endorse this. But, you know, this line right here is just absolutely horrible. Like, here's what it does. Here's what the collateral damage is. Here's why that's important. And it matters. Mm -hmm. If you want our endorsement, you can't do that. And they turned around and they said to me, well, do you have replacement language? that you could use. And I honestly, I didn't even know what that meant at that time. I had to call up a friend that was a lawyer that, that did lobbying stuff and said, what did they mean when they said that? Um, and this will tell you how long ago it was. They faxed me a copy of the law. Uh, there, you didn't attach things in email yet, right? So they faxed me a copy of the law. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talked to my friend that was a lawyer and we, we were able to change the language in it that was hiding behind anonymity to do a criminal act was illegal instead of all anonymous speech online is illegal. I understand. So it basically would escalate another crime versus being a crime on its own. Um, now that bill didn't end up passing, but that language ended up carrying through to the bills that did. And so by working with the legislature and the, the regulators at that phase, well, the legislature at that phase, you know, two hours of work, prevented anonymous speech online from never happening. You know, you'd never have posting via pseudonyms in the United States. Effectively, ISPs would have had to KYC all their users so that everyone was always posting everything from their real name. And so by working with the legislature, we were able to eliminate that threat and allow the internet to become much more of a bastion of free speech than it would have been otherwise. You are somewhat inspiring me to take a slightly more hopeful uh, and proactive position with regard to regulators. Because just, just to share something personal, I mean, part of the reason I'm not in the US right now is as, as much as I love the country, I have really trying, uh, I'd say failed to make an impact on the government's point of view on crypto and blockchain and you know, get this sort of enforcement, this punitive enforcement mechanism rather than working with the, the industry and I just was annoying. And then here we are in the UAE where they're either benign or they're listening or if they overstep, yep. they, they roll it back, which is very pleasant. Uh, but you're, you're giving the reasons I'm here. Of responsiveness, which is nice. Thank you. Yeah, honestly, it's, it's one of the main reasons that I'm here is because there's proactive regulators that are leaning into the industry that are both sophisticated enough to understand and write rules for our ecosystem mm -hmm. and also then well-funded enough to properly enforce them so we don't end up becoming the next Bahamas. And, you know, I did that. Did, did, for just for the audience, explain what that meant, that little dig. So we don't be, end up becoming the next Bahamas means. Uh, so FT, FTX was based out of the Bahamas and yes. they actually had written some very good rules around, uh, around digital assets and cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. But, you know, FTX was actually like way better funded than the regulator there was. 
And so the regulator wasn't able to effectively enforce or control those regulations. And we ended up with, you know, what appears to have been, well, and now is criminally shown to be a giant fraud that, you know, damaged hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people and set our industry back by years yes. as a result of it, that fraud being allowed to be perpetrated. And so, you know, uh, forward leading regulators and ones that write good rules are, are fantastic, but they also need to be able to enforce them so that we as an industry can grow and build trust in the end users that we want to attract to get to mass market adoption. Okay, good explanation. So we, we, we jumped over something. I want to go back. What was your transition point from the US to the, the UAE? Yeah, so starting maybe about a year ago, I started, you know, one, the, the, the regulation in the US, uh, particularly out of the SEC, doesn't feel like it's going in the right direction, mm -hmm. right? I actually have a ton of respect for the people in US Treasury and CFTC. They seem to be doing great work. And, and a lot of the people in SEC are great as well, but the leadership there is definitely not pro our industry or leaning. Right. And so, you know, I started looking for an ecosystem that had a combination of really three things. One is the regulator I just spoke about that is both sophisticated enough to write rules for our industry and well-funded enough to supervise it. Mm -hmm. And we see that with both ADGM and VARA. So there's two regulators here that I think do a great job. I think uh, Rachel Khanna may be good as well. I just haven't had time to look at it yet. So I can't pass an opinion on that one way or another. Um, the second was an environment. Pass. I'll hook you up with James, who's down there. He's coming on the show, and maybe you guys can have a conversation also. I'd love to chat with them. Yeah, I've just been had too many other things going on. I haven't had a chance to look yet. Um, the yeah. second is uh, an environment of other like Web3 crypto startups mm -hmm. that I can work with, both just to bounce ideas off of, but also as potential customers. And, and the third is access to capital, because I'm a startup and access to capital is an important thing. Yes. And so, you know, there were really three jurisdictions that came to the top of the list that are all great jurisdictions for digital assets today. Uh, one was Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, one was Singapore, and one was UAE. And for a few reasons, UAE just came out on the, on the top of that pile, um, primarily just because I felt like there was going to be more short-term and long-term support here than you might see in some of the other jurisdictions at the moment. Even more than in Singapore. That's interesting. Um, so S Singapore is great. I love Singapore. I've spent a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I first started going there in 1998 uh, when the company I was at then uh, provided a uh, half or a third of the internet for the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's definitely a country I have a lot of uh, great feelings for, but um, they had some uh, issues where citizens in their country lost a bunch of money. Um, either due to fraud or just due to bad startups or things like that. And so for a period of time, it's just slowed things down a little bit there while the regulator gets their feet back underneath them and figures out the risks and controls around that properly. Okay. And so it's a fantastic ecosystem, but there's just like a maybe, a, in my view, maybe like a 12 to 18 month slowdown that's happening there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's going to be fantastic long-term. I think it's going to be a great place. But you know, if I was making a choice for this minute, uh, here has some strength over there. It's it's funny you you gotta you gotta move fast to keep up with the Justins of the world because you can be behind by twelve or eighteen months and the next thing you know he's off to the UAE. So we're we're in a very nimble. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, for um, sure. And and go ahead. by the way, I still I still engage with the U.S. regulators, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm setting up calls with U.S. Treasury to talk to them about what's going on in DeFi and things like that to try and make sure they're on the right page going forward. I talk to regulators indirectly through a working group I'm on. I talk to the regulators in Canada about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely like, I haven't lost hope for North America. It's just not, for me, it doesn't seem to be the right time there. And, you know, you see that with actually like large financial institutions that are doing their digital asset experimentation inside of places like ADGM or DIFC or places mm -hmm. like that, rather than doing it in the U.S. Yes. Now, no, we, we, where is NetKey formed here? Is it inside ADGM? Yep. Yeah, we have a we have a company inside of ADGM. So our our headquarters is in still in the United States. We're a Delaware corporation. You mm -hmm. know, uh, the headquarters is in California, but we've got an ADGM entity as well. Fantastic. And let's we're we're kind of running a little bit up on time, but you're fascinating. So I'm going to let it keep going. T tell me about Hub Seventy One and your involvement. Sure. 
So um, Hub71 is a program that was put together uh, kind of through ADGM with some backing from Mubadala, uh, the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, to attract top startups to the region to come and work and build out of ADGM. And they have a few different programs that's going on, but you know, one of them is actually about going out and recruiting and, and bringing top firms to come to work in the region and come to work out of ADGM. Mm-hmm. So I just came through uh, their first uh, digital asset cohort where they brought in about eight digital asset companies from across the globe, from you know, the US, Europe, Asia, et cetera, to come and open an office uh, here in Abu Dhabi and start to grow outside of the area. And so they provide some small financial incentive uh, that basically like offsets the cost of setting up the, the office here. So like registration fees and things like that. And then uh, they make a, a very small investment in the company as well um, as a part of that. That's basically, uh, it's, it's a super um, easy safe note where they basically says, whatever your next investor gets, we get, um, uh, but no hair on it that you would see in other engagements that gives them like a preference or anything like that and then they also provide some on on the ground support so one uh they had some digital asset specific support where they would bring in things around around fundraising etc and then they've actually got a go-to-market team that makes introductions to businesses in the region and they also have a fundraising team that makes introductions to investors in the region so um One, you get some halo effect because in the program I went through, there were 2,500 companies that applied and like less than 30 that got in. Um, And so a lot of folks in the area will recognize if you're a Hub71 company, it means you've already been through a pretty stringent vetting process. Um, But then they also provide some material support in terms of introductions, et cetera. And because it's part of ADGM, you actually have some good access to be able to, you know, talk to and get feedback directly from the regulator if that's something that's important to your business. And and has have you personally and your company personally made use of these introductions to customers and to investors? Absolutely. Yeah. And wh- sure. what has that been like? Um, you know, so I would say. Overall, it's actually been great. So we are doing fundraising at the moment, and it's very likely that our lead investor will come out of one of the introductions that was made by Hub71. Maybe not, but but there's a good possibility that that's going to happen. Good and point. we've got probably three or four leads in our sales pipeline right now that came through introductions that they made, and they continue to make new ones. And, you know, some of those customers they've introduced to would be certainly among our top five or 10 clients that we have if we end up closing those deals. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, they're making good introductions to potentially material clients. That's that's great. And actually, I'm thinking about you got two validators. You got the mere fact you're you're formed in ADGM, which is, as I understand, its own process. They're not casual about who they let set up business there and you go through a whole vetting procedure and and you're by definition a bit regulated no matter what you're doing. And then you got the Hub 71 additional layer of selection. So you have sort of a a compliance slash we trust you validation. Then we have a we like your company validation, both from a very well-respected local financial free zone. So that's that's exactly, yeah. Two for the price. I don't know about two for the price of one, but two, two in the same sale, if you like. Um, totally. Yeah. So the, the selection process was, you know, it was diligent. Let's just say, you know, there were a lot of interviews and questions back and forth and decks and paperwork and all that sort of stuff. But I, I would certainly say it's been worth it. it. It's been, I've been through a couple of other accelerators before, and this one was by far the most beneficial one I've ever been. Through. Interesting. Um, l- let me, let me end on something we hadn't discussed before, but I just want to hit it. If you're doing your identity and that's a core principle of what you're doing. How are you facing the AI challenge and deep face and deep voice and everything else that's coming up? No problem. Yeah, no I problem. mean, a lot of the tools, yeah, it's honestly, it's no problem. So um, the, the way that we've developed and built our tools, they're highly resistant to AI generated fraud and deep face. Um, so, you know, if you, um, one of the ways that historically bad actors in the crypto and digital asset space 
mm-hmm. has have tried to uh, get through KYC and AML pro- problems and work quite well with our competitors is basically, you know, what I would call a replay attack. Yes. Where you like break into someone's KYC process, you steal all the documents and biometrics out of them, and then you try and replay them through another KYC and AML system. Mm-hmm. Well, we've developed our, we developed our solutions years and years and years ago to be able to detect those replay attacks by looking for artifacts that allow us to know that this isn't a real document, real original document, and this isn't a real original person. And while the AI generated stuff is a little different than a re- replay attack, mm-hmm. they're not real people and they're not real documents. So many of the algorithms and tools that we built to detect, is this really a real physical ID that I'm seeing? Mm-hmm. It's three-dimensional, barely three-dimensional, but three-dimensional and you know exists in the real and physical world. And is this a real three-dimensional human? Mm-hmm. that I'm dealing with that I can see move and be alive and is again, three-dimensional and not flat um, work against deep fakes. They work against AI generated images. It works against all those things. So are there some new things that we develop that let us know explicitly that it's AI generated? Yeah, absolutely. But actually the things that we developed long ago that let us understand it's a real physical human and a real physical document already work quite well to determine, you know, AI generated images and deep fakes, et cetera. Great. Good answer. Um, Justin, I, I think that's it. We we went long, but you're fascinating. So I, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I want to wish you great continued success. Um, you seem to be on a, an amazing track. I'm, I'm glad you're here in the region. And I think you found a good home for you. And I, I love your calm, even clear, clear-eyed, methodical approach to things. That's one thing I've always kind of noticed about you. Um, you're not, you don't get emotionally worked up. It seems you you just kind of see the world how it is. You got a goal. You're going for it. You're aware of all the nuance, all the, the yada yada, but you just want to get stuff done. So I, I think that's very admirable and very great. So I, I see you Peter, well, as they say in Avatar. <laughs> Well, let me know when you get to Abu Dhabi. Let's grab a coffee or a meal together. Uh, It'd be my pleasure. Okay, I'm going to kill the recording. Thank you so much.